Welcome to The Mend, a podcast to learn about services and support for victims and survivors of crime, sponsored through the Center for Crime Victim Services. My name is Anna Nasset, and I'm your host for this bi-monthly podcast and show. Um, and today, I'm very excited to have Captain Lance Burnham here to talk about state police law enforcement's roles serving victims of crime. The show was created to take a deep look at services, organizations, and concepts for victims and survivors of crime. We want to acknowledge the healing process and provide resources, not only in the state of Vermont, but throughout the country that will benefit victims and survivors of crime. With that in mind, we always urge you to listen at your own discretion, as we may talk about our own personal stories, cases, or other sensitive subject matter. Today, I'm delighted to have Captain Lance Burnham here. He has over 23 years in law enforcement experience with the state of Vermont and the state police. He has spent the past 13 years in the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, where he has a number of roles. He started his detective career with the Special Investigations Unit, investigating serious child abuse and sexual abuse investigations of children. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant, where he remained in the State Police Bureau of Criminal Investigations, investigating homicides, officer-involved shootings, white-collar crime. Upon being promoted to the rank of lieutenant, he oversaw the state of the Vermont State Police Forensic Investigations Team, as well as the polygraph unit. He has supervised numerous homicide investigations and oversaw four special investigation units, um, overseeing up to 18 detective state police technology investigations unit. He is the current emergency communication commander overseeing all DPS emergency dispatches and 911 call call takers. He sits on the Vermont Human Trafficking Steering Committee and oversees all human trafficking investigations throughout the state of Vermont. That is quite the prolific career. Thank you so much for being here today, Lance. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, we've been working toward this one for a while with um, delays with COVID, so thank you. I'd love to start just by getting to know you a little bit better. Can you share with our listeners a little bit more about your history and how you found yourself called to the work of law enforcement? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm a Vermonter. I grew up in Vermont, um, up in Lamoille County, where I'm actually currently living now with my family. Um, I, 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 I get that question a lot as far as law enforcement, like what drives you to do this? And I I really don't know how to answer that because I don't really know because I have had an interest in law enforcement probably since I was like three to five years old. And it was just something that I just knew I was gonna do. Um, There was a time when uh, after high school and college, I actually joined the military and said, you know, well, maybe I won't get into law enforcement, but that was maybe a blip in time. And then I, I applied to be a, a police officer and I, I never regretted it. I've had, as you said, I've had a, a very unique career. I've been very blessed. Um, I've worked with some tremendous people, um, even on the victim side and quite frankly, even on the offender side. Um, I, I, I'm one of those guys that believe that people make mistakes. And um, if you talk to people, whether it be a victim, an offender, or what have you, and listen to their story. There's always um, there's always a unique background from everybody, and that's kind of where I've always wanted my career to go, just to learn a lot about that. So that's awesome. Um, I'm a big believer in rehabilitation and getting to know individuals as well. And it's so cool that you got to fulfill your childhood dream. I wanted yeah. to be a ballerina. That didn't really work out for me. So <laughs> happy for you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I have had someone on here from uh, the Montpelier Police Department. So can yep. you just share with our listeners the difference between state patrol and local police departments? Sure. I mean, in, in the state of Vermont, there really is not a major difference. I mean, we go to the same police academy. We, we receive the same training. Um, it really depends on really who's cutting your check at the end of the pay period. Um, you know, but... Uh, the state police, and we're not necessarily state patrol, we are state police, and there's a, there is a major difference there. State patrol, you, usually the, the troopers that are up on the interstate and only handling traffic and stuff like that. 
Uh, the state police within Vermont, we cover 212 towns in Vermont, which is about 80 to 85% of the land mass of Vermont. So we are the primary responsibility. We're the primary law enforcement agency for Vermont. Um, we are the largest, um, which kind of allows our agency to provide a lot of, um, as you said, unique opportunities for troopers, uh, which is really what drove me to this agency. But at the same time, we're very small. Uh, you compare Vermont State Police to, you know, Connecticut or something like that. We are, we are very, very small, and it, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to go anywhere in the state of Vermont, and I would know who who that trooper was that I went and spoke to. But, but you know, the day to day business, it really isn't a major difference. Awesome. I mean, that's one of the things that makes us so such a special state is that we can go anywhere and know people and be connected because. Um, and I always like I always make a distinction when I when I'm out speaking like between the state police and local police department a lot of nuances to what I'm talking about and so I yeah. thank you for sharing that with listeners who might not know. Yeah. Um, how do you view your role as law enforcement. Uh, what does it mean to you, and how has it shifted over your years of service. Well, I think. Any any law enforcement officer that gets into this work initially, they want to see themselves, and I, I'm I'm no different. They see themselves as an enforcer. You know, they see themselves as my job is to go out and enforce the law, um, whether it be through uh, traffic citations, through criminal investigations, through um, everyday just calls of service. You know, the, our job is to really enforce the law in the state. But what I noticed as, you know, being in law enforcement for the past 23 years, um, through age, through maturity, through experience, uh, I really see things at a different level now. Um, I see us more as, um, uh, as leaders, as uh, instructors, uh, as developers, because law enforcement, especially nowadays, is changing so rapidly that we need to develop with the times and we need people to be able to keep up and develop certain protocols and certain um, commitments and units and develop something. But then all this, as soon as it's developed, you turn into a leader because you want to make sure that you have someone in place that can guide our young troopers to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So, you know, so it kind of went more from this, um, to this enforcer, to this guider, I guess, or, you know, this, hey, I'm here, we're, let's protect something that we just built. And, you know, and, and I think too, you learn as you, as you age and you learn as you mature in your career, you become a very good, um, you know who you need to talk to. And we're, we're the state police, we work for the community and we know that we need to get out in there and talk to them to get their opinions. And so it, it, it kind of morphs, you know, and it, I remember when I first got hired, I was like, I'm going to write X amount of tickets. I'm, I'm going to be in uniform for the rest of my career. But then I kind of figured out, you know, I really like this criminal stuff. I really like slowing cases down and finding out what happened and using a lot of resources, which really drove me into the detective bureau. Awesome. It sounds like it really shifted from enforcer to service and yeah, service absolutely. of the community, of the state, of all the individuals. Um, and that's really good to hear. Um, I think, you know, all of us that are in this work, whatever field, whatever part it is that we're in, it it comes from service. Um, yeah. Yeah, at least for me and some, yeah. Yep. So digging a little bit further into your career, um, your very prolific career with the Vermont State Police, often we think of officers as just simply that officers, you know, right? It's doing these things, but you've had um, been with the SVU with homicides, officers involved shooting, white collar crimes, for forensic and polygraphs and technology. You're now with the Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, can you share with us how you approach those jobs? Um, just a little bit more in depth about your career and how you approach investigations within those jobs. Sure. You know, uh, I've been very lucky to have a wide variety of positions uh, with the state police. Um, 
you know, even starting my career as a road trooper in Memorial County, um, I was assigned to an outpost and you learn very quickly that um, you need to be ingrained into the community um, because uh, you don't have backup. You really don't. You're, uh, there was times I'd have 12 towns that I was responsible for on my shift. Um, but, you know, and, and then, as I said, I really got interested into the detective side. Um, so I really, I, I, when I first got into our detective bureau, I, I got into our uh, special investigations unit. And that really set the tone of, for the rest of my career because they are very difficult cases. Uh, anytime you deal with child abuse or child sexual assaults or anything like that, it, it hits you in the gut. And you have to you have to take that and really, for the first time in my career, I really had to listen to the victims. And um, you, thank God we have very um, high level training for these for these detectives that can still continue to do these work. Um, so it, like I said, although I changed from the enforcer to the service, that really set the stage for the rest of what I was going to do in my career. Um, but, you know, it, you have to learn to adapt. And law enforcement officers uh, nowadays, uh, they do. We have to be adaptable. Um, and I've had not only I've had a number of positions, I've had a unique variety of positions. You know, from if anyone would have told me, hey, 20 years ago, you're going to be the commander of our of our emergency communication center, I would have said, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, right. Or even, hey, we're gonna develop uh, the technology investigations unit, and you're gonna oversee it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know about that. But each of those has very unique um, uh, roles. And every, it, I can't do uh, a special investigations unit case. I can't handle that the way I would handle a homicide investigation. You know, you have to learn to adapt within those things. And having all of that unique background makes me a better person. It makes me a better leader. Um, it makes me a better um, advocate for the state police or law enforcement in general, because I've done so much that I have that ability to, to say, maybe that's not the right way to go about. And let's look at it this way, because it's it, you bring a unique aspect to it and what i like about that those a lot of those positions that i had is i may have been the lieutenant or um the sergeant that was leading those investigations but we always work as a unit um and everyone has a say um you, i'm it might be my name on the affidavit but there was probably 10 people that helped me get to the point where we were able to close out a case awesome yeah, and that is, I mean, it sounds like with this career that you've had, you've really become family with this group of people who you've worked with and have been flowed out and within that. Um, kind of just to pop in another question, in the nature of the work that you do, you know, when handling child sexual assault cases, when handling homicides, when having to digest all of that information, um, how do you find that you're able to to process that, to release those things to, for lack of a better term, self-care, like how do you find that you're able to, to work through what you, what you're taking in? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I have, when I got married um, and my wife knew that I wanted to get into law enforcement, uh, I made a promise to her that I would never bring my work home. And Luckily, and I don't know how I did it, I, I still do that. I don't, I, when I come home, if I'm wearing my uniform, I take my uniform off and then I'm dad. Um, so uh, when I, it, it's almost, the uniform is almost like a shedding process. <laughs> you know, you, you take it off and I left that at the door. Um, but internally you do, you take that. And I've, I've had some very difficult cases throughout my career that clearly had an effect on me. Um, I, I love to cycle. I, I ride my bike. Um, so when I really know that, hey, uh, this has been a bad day, um, I will leave and just get on my bike and, and pedal and pedal and pedal. 
um, because that's an, that's an outlet for me. And I was lucky enough to find that. And so that way, when I come home or after that ride, that's out, that stress is gone. And I, I'm able to reconnect with my family and be, and be there for them. Awesome. It sounds like you've got some really good things in place and strategies to be able to, yeah, balance the work and life on a level that most of us will never have to do. Yeah. And I, and I will say uh, with the, with our agencies, we're very lucky to have uh, a member's assistance team that um, really reach out to people with these difficult cases to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, We do have clinicians that uh, assist us with, Hey, if we're having, if, if we are, are noticing either another trooper or I notice someone that works for me is having a difficult time. It's just a phone call for me to say, Hey, I need you to reach out to trooper X or whoever. Uh, and it's been a very positive thing for our agency. They, they're a tremendous unit. Awesome. Yeah. That's really good. I mean, it's a lot of just, there's a lot of just like that bystander part of it, of just being able to look at the people around you and notice when, they're faltering mm-hmm. in the different places that that might come from. So Absolutely. I'm glad to hear that's in place. Yes. Um, so kind of switching into your practices, how have you approached each of these jobs with a victim centered practices or what you learned over your career to become victim centered and put victims first when working cases? Um, and, you know, just, I'll just kind of combine the two questions, like when interviewing victims, how do you navigate getting the information you need without re-traumatizing and still continuing to give people their dignity, their agency, all of those things? So kind of just what's your approach? Yeah. Well, I, I think that law enforcement in general, whether or not we realize it, it's a victim-centered approach no matter what. Uh, it's usually the victim that calls us for help. Um, it's usually uh, the victim that we're first talking to, um, you know, aside from maybe a phone call. Um, but they, they are exactly why we have a job and why we have these careers. Um, so, you know, and then morph that into kind of the detective role, especially with the special investigations unit. You know, we, we, as soon as you become a detective in that unit, you are, or back then you were sent to a forensic interviewing training. Like, how do you talk to kids or how do you talk to victims that um, have experienced something that's just horrendous? Um, and not only that, but training somebody to, um, talk to a victim, um, and I'll use this as an example. How do I, as a male, um, in a in a position of authority, um, talk to a female who may have had the worst experience in her life? That it could be shameful, could be embarrassing to them. How do I get them to open up and tell me what happened? That's a very difficult thing to do, and it's a process. And it's not like I just go into a room and sit down with and say, okay, tell me what happened. It, that, that just doesn't happen and it can't happen and it should never happen. And there's a process of how you get to the point where you can get the information that you, that you need. Um, back then, we just didn't even know, we didn't have a term for it. It wasn't, oh, victim centered. We were, we've been doing it all along, but now there's a term for it that says, well, that's victim centered policing or that's. Um, trauma-informed interviewing. We've been doing that all along. We just didn't really know that we were doing it. Um, So, you know, I think that's where I was very lucky and all these detectives that are in these SIU positions now will realize how lucky they are to get that training because not everyone gets it um, because they'll take that with them for the rest of their career and quite frankly, the rest of their life because that has helped me just having communications out in the field when I'm talking with friends or when I'm talking to whoever, you know, it teaches you to communicate. Um, to answer your question, as far as how, how do we use that to, to stay neutral? Um, we, as investigators, we, we let, we're fact gatherers. Um, we will always 
we always want to believe our victims. We always want to believe our victims um, that are coming to us and saying, this is what happened to me. And we do. But we also have a process of what we have to do to get to the end result of the investigation. And within that process are facts. And we are fact gatherers. Um, and it's we, we still may say, okay, this is what happened to you, but if we don't have the facts that can back up what our victim may be saying, it's, that's ultimately our goal is we're not saying that this is untruthful. We're just saying we just don't have the information to prove what you're telling us. Um, so it's, uh, it's a difficult line sometimes. And, you know, and it's, uh, sometimes it's frustrating because sometimes the facts just aren't there. And especially when you have someone that may come to us 20 years down the road, when they're finally ready to talk to us, um, that's hard. That's, that's very difficult. And sometimes, and, and I've said this throughout my whole career, you know, law enforcement has to get away, away from, especially in these types of cases, that thinking a success is putting handcuffs on an offender. That is not necessarily our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is making sure that that victim gets the services that they need and has the ability to tell us their story. And if we can't make an arrest, that's fine. We're, we're fine with that and we're good with that. But did we get the resources that the victim may need um, to get them in a better place? If we've done that, that should be considered our win, not necessarily whether or not we arrested somebody. We have to look forward at their victims. Absolutely. Justice looks, looks so different for every single person. It's, yeah. you know, I think that's, we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, as myself, you know, we're taught like, oh, well, justice means this person goes to prison or they're arrested or they're held accountable. But that, you know, especially in these cases from long ago where someone's now reporting um, this does look really, really different. Um, yeah. But I really like your approach, and it sounds like you really, you know, there's a big campaign right now called Start by Believing. It sounds mm -hmm. like you really, um, you do that. Well, I think, it, and I, I, I'll say this too, that our our agency, the Vermont State Police, um, we are very fortunate to have Colonel Birmingham as our leader right now. He's, he's very forward thinking. Um, we, um, he, he wants innovative ideas and he's not afraid to try certain things. Um, and I use this as an example. I'm not saying that this is where every department should do, but I use this more as an example of, of just be, how innovative we as law enforcement can be. I had a detective come to, came to me when I was overseeing our polygraph unit and says, I don't like how we do interviews. And I remember saying, well, we do interviews the way we were taught. And he's like, yes, but maybe what if there's something better out there? And so he came to me with an idea of this new interviewing model that was being used up in Canada. And we, we pitched the idea to the Colonel and saying, hey, this is backed on science. It's backed on uh, what we should be doing. It's innovative. No one else is doing it, but would you be at least interested in us researching it and see if it's the right thing? Absolutely. So we sent three detectives up into Newfoundland, Canada, researched this interview style. It's called the peace model. Um, I selected three people from varying backgrounds just to make sure we weren't going up there and saying, yeah, this is the Cadillac we wanted. And they all came back and said, this is what we, what we need to do. Um, and the colonel absolutely agreed because it's the right thing to do. And right now, as an agency, we are the only agency in the United States that is moving towards this model. And we have other agencies across the nation that are reaching out to us and following us to watch the success stories, because that is going to happen throughout the rest of the country. I have no doubt about it. Um, but it is a model that is based really on empowerment of our victims, because it would be great if we could go into every interview and not ask a question and get everything that we needed. <laughs> and, um, but that's what this interview style really is. It's like, hey, Anna, tell me what happened. And listening to them and asking appropriate questions at certain times, 
that's all backed on science and psychology, it's a win-win for everybody. That's amazing. I love hearing that. Um, that's very cool. And I'm excited. I, I normally don't share negative stories, but I put in the questions that like the only, in all of my years of dealing with police with my own case, the only real negative response I've had was from the Vermont State Patrol. And I had to go there. I was sent by my law enforcement in Washington State to to the barracks in Middlesex to make a report um, when things are really out of control. And I had to go there again um, to have a sign, a witness, someone witness legal statements before I faxed it out to Washington. And it was really frustrating. It was really sad. I left there feeling so defeated. And um, yeah, they basically just, especially when I went there to make a report, they just didn't make a report, didn't look at my files. I mean, it files from my my other law enforcement with, and they looked at nothing and just sent me out the door. And it was really frustrating. So it's good to hear that it sounds like things are kind of shifting. And, um, you know, maybe that having a bad day, who knows, but, but I like to hear that things are shifting in a better, uh, more victim centered place. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm sorry that happened to you. I, you know, I certainly can't speak to the troopers at the time. Uh, I will say that that's an anomaly, um, from what I hear from our troopers. Um, uh, but again, I, 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 the other thing too, I think what a lot of people have to understand is, and you even said it, that you know, our troopers are human beings. Uh, we have bad days, we have good days, we have terrible days. Um, and you know, it, it, that, and that's unfortunate that happened, um, but uh, we do have processes in place where if that does happen, we want the people to say, hey, that was not right. You know, we have supervisors, um, we have commanders in place that make sure that that does not happen. Uh, especially anything that happens with exactly, and, and I'm familiar with your, um, with your investigation, you know, and, and, you know, just to give, uh, to, I'm not patting ourselves on the back, but uh, I think it's important for everyone to know really how lucky we are in Vermont. Um, we are the only agency in the nation that uh, Colonel Birmingham basically said, I want every commander to attend this training. We invited uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, to Vermont, and it was mandatory for anybody from the rank of lieutenant all the way up to the colonel to attend this training based on incidents such as your, your investigations. Um, that's never happened before, and we take that very seriously. Out of that, we've developed protocols, we've developed policies to make sure that incidents like that, that happened to you, never happen. That's amazing. That's amazing. And and my kind of follow-up was I ended up figuring out which officer patrols this area where I live of the Bad River Valley and getting a hold of him directly and saying, this is my situation. If anything ever happens, just so you know, and he yeah. couldn't have been. Covered. Um, so, you know, I okay. found my way around it, but that's, that's good to hear that you guys are doing it. And it's, you know, I mean, it just, it takes so much training and it takes, so much, especially, you know, in a case like mine where everything's happening in Washington, they're like, well, we can't do anything for you. But, right. but you know, so it's, I've had to learn a lot as well and learn where my expectation should be too. Um, yeah. So it's, it sounds like your Colonel is a really awesome individual. I'm glad that he's, he's leading you all. Um, so kind of moving on, like, this kind of goes along the same questions, like what bar barriers do you think people face when reporting crimes to law enforcement? And how do you think we can continue to overcome these? Well, I think uh, I, I, I believe it really depends on what type of incident that that person has gone through. Um, uh, I'll use domestic violence um, as, as an example. Uh, unfortunately, it's very prevalent in Vermont. Um, one of the biggest barriers really is um, the victims is they, there's a lot of process that they go through before they're even a willing to tell the police. I mean, some people, if they become a victim, their immediate reaction is I'm taking care of this and I need to make, I need to report this and I need to take action and I need to follow this through, you know, but there's also those people that, um, where once you're victimized, it's trauma to the brain, it's trauma to the body, it's trauma. 
and they don't process that the way a normal human being would or, or someone that's not a victim. They go through a self-blame, they go through a shame period, um, an embarrassment. Um, they're going to feel all those things. And the last thing they want to do is go to a trooper, whether it be male or female, and say, hey, this happened to me. Um, and we understand that now through our training, through trauma-informed policing, this is why people wait, or this is why people react the way they do when they talk to us about certain incidents. Um, and really, a lot of the times, what I used to see a lot was just plain fear. Um, the especially a victim of a, of a domestic violence incident is they know that when they report that in the state of Vermont, we are mandated by law to remove that person and we have to place that person under arrest. And that takes a number that, that makes the victim again, victimized again, because we now may have just taken their financial abilities away from the victim. We may have taken her medical abilities of the victim that person may come back and be more violent. So there's a lot that's going through these victims' heads as to, is this worth me reporting to the police? And, you know, there's no way for me to say, yes, you should, you have to, you have to do all these things because I'm, I've never really been a victim. I don't know. Um, and I'm never going to second guess a victim whether or not they think they should or whether they should not. Um, it's, I think that, the message that we as law enforcement need to send is like, we are here, we're here when you're ready. And um, we need to be upfront with our victims and say, this is the process. And this is what may happen, this is what may not. Um, but there needs to be communication. Absolutely, I think you really nailed it completely well. I, I get a lot of, emails and calls and consult for consultations and, you know, we'll all be stopped, you know, before COVID and someone will be like, I have a friend that's going through this situation. Can I just call the cops? I'm like, no, you, you can't do that. Like it is, it is up to that individual to decide when they want to report and how they want to report. And there's a lot of different variables why they might not want to. Right. Um, well, it is domestic violence month. So I'm going to continue to train for a moment during the time of COVID that we're in right now, like how has that just, I mean, changed everything for us, but changed how you all are doing your jobs, especially regarding domestic violence, which we know is the stats are growing, even if the reports aren't showing it, like there's just, how is that for you all right now? Well, I think on the day-to-day -day basis for our uniformed troopers um, that are responding to this, it really hasn't been a major change. Um, you know, there's, the, and, and I don't say that to say, to be naive of, of COVID. I say that because when they do get the call, they're going to go and they're going to respond appropriately and they're going to investigate how they normally would even before COVID. The only difference is now they're probably going to do it with a mask on um, and they're going to communicate and there's going to, there's things like that. But what I will say, what COVID has forced us to do um, and what's really changed, especially right at the height when Vermonters were asked to stay home. Um, it, it was kind of eerie to be on the roads at that time because no one else was there. Um, but we, we, at that point, we told our troopers, you have to be seen. Uh, we want you in these communities. Go to the communities that you don't normally get a chance to go to because you're so busy going to everyone else. Just go sit in the parking lot and be seen. And it was very well received by those communities because they don't get an opportunity to see that trooper all the time. Um, so that really changed uh, a lot. You know, we, we, I've been monitoring the stats, you know, we have had an uptick during that time of domestic violence and uh, abuse prevention orders and things like that. Um, hasn't been a huge tick, but it's definitely gone up. Um, but it is definitely, has not really changed the investigative styles or anything like that of what they do. Um, I think that it's important that, you know, if, if a victim's going to call us for something like that, they need to know that we're going to be there and that we're going to be there quickly. So. Absolutely. Especially in this rural state that we live in, that can often be a fear of like how, you know, 
how long would they be till they're there? And I live in a community where I definitely noticed our officer was around a lot more. So yeah. Yeah. I think I might be one of those. It's like, <laughs> oh, he sure is around here a lot. <laughs> it's a good thing. So it's really it good is. Thing. Yes. Yes. So as we're starting to kind of shift down, um, just, you know, what are some of the fears and hurdles you have while doing your job? What are some of the things that you deal with? We talked a little bit about that earlier, but um, yeah, I would just love to hear more about that. You know, the fears and the hurdles that I face really with my position, um, the fears that I have as a commander, um, it is really right now, uh, I oversee right around 90 dispatchers, call takers and stuff like that. And, um, before I even really got into this position, you know, I didn't really know what they do. Uh, I didn't know. I mean, I knew, but I didn't really know the inner workings of what it took to become uh, a dispatcher for the state of Vermont. And really right now it's, do we have enough bodies? Do we have enough people that are willing to do this? Um, because it's, it's not like we can shut down. I can't say, sorry, 911, we're not able to answer the phone. Tonight. We don't have that ability. So I really worry about their health. I really, I really worry about their well-being. Make sure that they have what they need to do their jobs. Um, you know, looking outside of that, um, I, I worry what what is law enforcement going to look like in two, three, four years, um, especially in in during this time uh, regarding law enforcement. It's there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of reform that uh, everyone wants to happen. Uh, there's the defund police movement that wants to get a lot of media attention. And, you know, I, I, I fear that a lot of people think that there needs to be rampant change without, without inviting us to the table or about, without inviting us into the conversation before those changes are made. Um, so, you know, it, there's going to be a lot of changes. I just hope that the changes that are made are for the positive of everyone. Um, that's, that's kind of a, my, a hurdle that we are going to have to look into. Um, we, we are looking internally um, regarding our own agency. Um, the captains of the Vermont State Police, we, are, we meet regularly to make sure that, hey, what how are we as an agency? Where are we do? Do we need to change anything? Do we need to change our practices? Do we need to change how we patrol certain towns? Um, and, you know, we, we are looking at that heavily. Uh, but this is the first time in my career where if you would ask me where we're going to be in three years, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I, I can say soundly, and I say this uh, with full conviction that the people I work with are some of the best people on this planet. Uh, they are hard workers. They want to do the right thing. Um, we just, it's, it's a uncertain time now for sure. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're open to change and you know that it's coming and you'd like to be at the table to part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we've, we've been very open-minded and we've been, I mean, I, I want to, you know, and again, I, I feel like I'm tapping our agency on the back because I work here, but, you know, we, a number of years ago, we developed a fair and impartial policing position. Um, and again, we believe that we're the only uh, department in the nation that has this. And we have a fair and impartial policing committee that we respond to and we talk and we lead and we're bringing all these um, people to the table to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And, and that's not just VSP, we're inviting all the municipals, the sheriffs to, to make sure we as law enforcement are doing the right thing. Because again, we're part of these communities and you know we, we live in the town that we patrol sometimes and we need to know that are we doing the right thing? Because we do, we work for the communities. Yep. And we can all grow and we can all change and we can all do better. And it sounds like you all are doing a lot of things, already had a lot of things in place and are continuing to do that. So I yeah. think that's wonderful. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, I feel like that's a pretty good point to wind down today because we just covered a lot of ground. <laughs> so thank you so much, Captain Lance Burnham. It's been an honor chatting with you today. And I just greatly appreciate the work you're doing here in Vermont on thank so you. many levels. Um, if people would like information on the work you are doing, what resources would you suggest? Or if they're needing help, what would you suggest? You know, today's social media, everything's driven by social media. We have a very, uh, uh, very active social media team that, that keeps the community involved with what VSP is doing on a daily basis. Um, our website, anything that uh, any of our committees that we are on or anything of our daily basis of what Vermont State Police are doing are, are there. They, they can certainly get that. Um, and what I, I recommend people... Um, is to be active with your barracks. We have 10 barracks throughout the state of Vermont. Don't be afraid to show up to that barracks and get to know your troopers or, or approach a trooper at some point and do that. Be active. This is a, this is a spectator, this is not a spectator sport here. <laughs> you know, we want, we, we are in the process of developing committees, um, citizens advisory committees for our each barracks so people can say, hey, this is happening in my town. What are you going to do about it? Or, you know, that that gets us involved with the communities, but it also gets the community involved with, it, with us. Awesome. I want to <laughs> serve online. <laughs> you have a very active uh, citizen advisory board or citizens advisory panel uh, out of the Millisex barracks. They are that is probably the most active in the state right now. That's great. I love hearing that. Yep. Well, thank you so much. I always like to close with just like a short, like one sentence positive message that you want to leave with listeners. Um, so do you have any words of wisdom and positivity? Wisdom. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm going to quote something I saw uh, on the interstate coming up. I don't, the billboards that you see that flash the messages and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know who wrote this. I don't know who put this on the sign, but it said, slow down. You're already here. <laughs> and it dawned on me like, this is Vermont. We live in an outstanding state. It's beautiful here. Enjoy it. We are very lucky to live here. We could be in such a worse place. And sometimes we have a tendency to focus on the negative you're in Vermont. You're already here. We're good. I love that. I was <laughs> in Maine for a month and I just drove back last week. And just as I was driving through the mountains of Vermont and it's like, it's just stupidly beautiful. And I'm, I'm not an um, emotional person, but I started crying. I was like, oh, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> and I did slow down. Um, <laughs> Well, that does it this week for us. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, as always, if you have ideas or questions, you can email me, Anna at standupresources.com. I'm Anna Nasset, your host of The Mend. Thank you so much and be well.